In this lesson, we're going to cover how to do FKIK matching automatically. Um, so right now, when we are in FK mode or IK mode and we want to switch, uh, there's a transition that happens. It blends from one rig to the other. Because the other rig wasn't animated in that position, it's, it's left in whatever position it was last in when you last used it. So every time you switch, you're blending from one pose to another. And um, that blend can be beneficial at times. You know, like I actually prefer animating this way. Uh, and I'll use the blend as part of the animation. Usually I'll do the switch uh, during a part of a motion. Um, but some animators like it where it is uh, instant. So when I switch to uh, FK now, um, it'll be in this exact same position. I don't have to worry about the transition. I just start animating in FK. And I, I want to cover this uh, because it starts to introduce some of the finer points of rigging uh, and some scripting stuff. Um, but I'm not going to do it completely. And, and so there's a few caveats with this. Um, it's going to matter how you built uh, the joints for your arm. Um, let's go ahead and turn these on here. Oh, right. I hit all that stuff. Um, so to, oh, let me undo my FK arm pose here. Um, So when you build your arm, you can't really build it at an angle for this. What, what, um, well, let, let's first off say, currently our, our FK arm has an advantage over the IK arm in that we didn't lock the elbow out. It could rotate in whatever direction it wants. So we could have more than just one axis of rotation. Um, our IK arm can't do that. When we're mo moving an IK, you know, our IK handle kind of only allows it to bend on one axis. And it's technically one axis, even though it may be doing three to get there. And yeah, you can see already it's it's not just rotate Z, it's got a little bit of rotate Y, and sometimes it has a little bit of rotate X there, and it's going to depend how you set up your LRAs. Now, to prevent that, um, you'd have to line up all your LRAs so they all are oriented the same way. Um, and what I mean is X and Y are all you know, roughly facing the same way. I mean, yeah, there's a kink in here, so, well, I guess X wouldn't be facing the same way, but Y is facing, you know, all straight up. Z is all facing straight forward. Um, and there's no discrepancy there. Uh, and how we built this arm, there could be a slight twist in there. So, you know, this joint might face a little bit more this way. This joint here might face a little bit more forward. Uh, let's see, I think that's a poor example because I'm in local mode. But you know, I can see a little bit of a shift there that happens when we go from shoulder to elbow as far as Z is concerned. It's not it's not perfect. It's close, but not perfect. You know, it looks like shoulders facing off a little bit more towards this direction to me, and the elbow's facing a little bit more straight ahead. Um, so how do you build an arm that isn't like this? And, and so when, when I generally build a rig, I build it for this just in case, because usually the case is somebody says, we want a rig, uh, we just need it now, whatever's fine, this will be good. And then you go, well, I don't know, do we want FK, IK matching? And somebody goes, nah, I don't think we'll need that. And then inevitably, you know, a couple weeks down the pipeline, somebody goes, hey, can we get FK, IK matching in here? That'd be great. You know, some animator that didn't have input at the time or something. Uh, and now you have to go back and rebuild your arm to go do this. So um, the best way to get all the LRAs lined up would be when you first build your arm, build it out flat, either straight down or straight out to the side, and rotate it down and then freeze transformations on it. Uh, when it's first constructed, if it's flat on a flat plane, Z and Y will be straight up and down, even if X is you know bending at an angle from here to here, or, you know however bent your arm is. But you want it all on the same level. So you know if this was 10 units up, you don't want this joint 10 units up, elbow 10 units up, wrist 10 units up. Uh, and, you know, then the LRA for, you know, Z facing forward, Y facing straight up, or whichever direction you choose uh, for your arm. Um, now, in a, in a case like this, you know, how do, how do you make sure that when you build it up that it ends at that angle? Well, what I would do is probably build an arm. I'd add IK to it. Uh, I'd uh, group that IK handle move the pivot points group to here, back of the shoulder, so I could rotate that IK handle in a nice arc, you know, kind of the same way we do for the reverse foot, get it level, uh, and then um, delete the IK, and then, you know, point snap each of those joints to make sure they're level with the shoulder. 
uh, and then I'd build a new chain. And uh, oh, before I delete that uh, other chain, I'd also look at its rotations and then try to rotate the joint uh, back the opposite direction. So you know, if we had to rotate negative 60 to get up here. Um, on the original arm, I'd rotate the new arm uh, positive 60 to get it back down. So uh, that's the general idea behind it. So getting a flat arm and then I freeze transformations on it, but then the LRs would be flat. You know, I wouldn't have to adjust them. They'd just be oriented as fine. I just, the only thing I'd want to make is it all face in the same way, but I'd rotate them 90 degrees to do that. So by building it flat, I wouldn't really have to mess with the LRAs. And then I'd put it down in the arm. So in this case, I mean, if you want to, you can go back and rebuild it um, and, and do that. If, if you already have a skin character, save off a copy of your skin version, unskin everything, go rebuild the skeleton, skin, skin everything on, but don't paint your skin weights again. You could reference in uh, your model and then copy skin weights from the reference model onto the new one. Um, and you should be able to salvage most of your weights that way, if not all of them. Usually I could get all my weights on uh, and it's not an issue. So uh, if you haven't watched the movie on referencing, uh, you can look on how to do that. Skin uh, copy weights is under animation. Skin edit smooth skin copy skin weights. Um, so you know that's a little bit on setting up the arm. So and here's another reason we want this is while FK and the skinning joints, you know, so the JNT joints and the FK rig joints, those two will have no problem lining up ever. Uh, and we'll put the same numbers on each and be fine, and they'll be able to switch back and forth, and they'll always line up. Um, I don't know what causes this, but something about the way I cave solves. I could have, you know, make one arm duplicate it two times. I have the FK rig and I have the IK rig. I'll have them in the same position, and something about some of those positions, all the numbers on the, are the same on the joint, uh, from the FK rig to the IK rig to the skinning rig, but they're in different positions. Like I'd see, like, well, this elbow's here and this elbow's here, but they're in the same spot and they have the same numbers for rotations on them. How does that work? Um, so that's a weird little quirk with IK, and I've never quite figured out how to do that perfectly. But if I have the LRAs lined up um, from the start, uh, that stuff seems to work out much better, where the, the variance is something like, you know, 0 0.05. 0 0.05 is, is, you know, kind of the most discrepancy we have in the rotations. So it doesn't ever get it completely out of there, but it definitely lowers it down enough so you don't really notice, you know, that it's not perfectly lined up. It's close, but mathematically it's a little bit off, but, you know, you'd have to be zoomed in pretty close to notice the difference uh, during the switch. So, okay, so that, those are the things we're kind of starting with. Um, also, I'm not going to do, uh, do scale uh, in this. So if you're doing this FKIK switching, you can build it in if you want. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that eventually. Um, but I'm not going to do it in this. And the reason for that, again, is that discrepancy uh, between the IK matching stuff is, is just magnified when they're scaling on. And I, again, I don't know why. Uh, you know, I look at my numbers and all the math lines up, but they'll just be in different positions. Um, and plus, there's a little bit more you have to do. You have to measure the length of the FK arm to get it in position. So uh, that's kind of the, the starters for this. So this is that's where we're going with this uh, and kind of the, the box that fits in for now. Um, there's also a couple things we have to do to this existing rig to start to get it to work, but then the rest will just kind of be done through scripting. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'm looking at my list here. Uh, okay, let's let's deal with the elbow rotations first. Uh, so I'm going to go into my outliner here, and we're just going to lock off the elbow, so it can only rotate on one axis. Now that might limit your animation some. You want to do uh, in FK if you want, you know, a little bit loopier motion uh, than you know the rigid kind of more realistic human motion stuff. Um, so again, this is a trade-off. It's it's automating one thing. Uh, it, this is always the case. Automating things is usually a cost-benefit sort of thing. Of you get this, you know, here's the gain, but here's also the loss. Um, and the loss is we will we will lose other axes of rotation while in FK mode. Um, but that's the decision we're making because somebody's requesting this, and that's what we're building. Um, so I'm going to look at all the elbow joints. So just go through each rig on left and right. And I'm opening up the attribute editor here. And I'm going over to limit information, rotate, and let me make sure. I think it's Z. Yeah. So I'm going to hit, it's currently on zero, so I'm hitting this arrow button, and that moves zero into the min and max, the, the current number. 
and then I'm just going to turn that on to be locked. So it can only move in one axis now. And I'm just going to keep doing this for all the other uh, axes. And this is blue because it has that constraint on it. Uh, but we already knew that. Um, shoulder IK. And I'll go ahead and do this for the right right now too, just because I'm in here. Um, I'll do some stuff for the right here, but I'm probably only going to do the left arm here. Well, no, I'll probably do both. It won't take that much longer, I don't think, because I got a lot of this scripted. Uh, so while I'm doing this, I'm going to explain to you guys. Uh, so, so I built a script to do the FKIK switching. So what you'll have to do this part, um, if you've followed along with kind of my naming conventions and you know your character is similar enough that you could actually do that, um, you should be able to use the scripts that I've provided here uh, to do the FKIK matching. Um, and it should work. Uh, the only discrepancy would be if one of your names uh, aren't the same as mine. Um, and in that case, you do just have to update your, your control name or update your um, uh, update the script for those names. Okay, so I think those are all locked out. The one other thing I want to do is I want to go lock out rotations on the FK control. I think, I think we already did that. Let me double check that. No, we didn't. Okay, so I just want Z there. Lock and hide selected. Okay, so now we know our elbows can theoretically match up. And, and again, these should be the exact same joints, um, though again, we'll see just some discrepancies if you're, if you're checking the numbers between IK and FK, um, but this will help it line up. Um, one of the other things we need is, so matching the FK to the IK rig is not a problem because we could just use the joint rotation and translate that back onto the controls. Um, so you, you take the joint rotations on the IK rig and put those numbers literally onto uh, these controls. And that should work because these controls were oriented the same way as these joints when they were made. And so it's, you know, whatever this rotates, that one rotates the same thing. Um, so those numbers are interchangeable. Uh, moving the IK, the FK is a little bit trickier though because it's not rotations, it's this point here attached to the wrist and this elbow uh, pull vector. So finding the point on the wrist is no problem, but finding where this guy is is a little bit trickier. Uh, but it's not that hard. So uh, what I'm going to do is make a couple locators to be able to do that. And modify create locator. I can make a control for this, but really this isn't something I'm going to ever touch. Alright, so I made one down there. It's it's down at the origin. I'm Shift selecting this uh, elbow control, I'm hitting P to parent, and I'm zeroing this out. So that's now in the same position as that control, and unparent it. And I will do the same thing on this other side. So creating the locator, parenting it to that box, zeroing it out, unparenting it. And I'll call these, let's say, uh, I don't know, left, folk for locator, and PV, just because it's the thing that's going to tell me where my pole vector is. And, oh, no, that's right. Okay, so I'm going to parent constrain these to follow the FK rig here, uh, and the FK shoulder, specifically. So left shoulder, FK, constrain, parent. And when I click on this guy, he should be blue, not the other way around. And the same for the right shoulder. Oh, wait, which one did I just do? Okay, good, that was the FK rig. I thought I did the IK rig for a second. Um, okay, right shoulder, FK. Strain parent. Okay, so here's what we just did. So wherever I move this arm now, in theory, if I move that control there, that's where the pull vector is aiming. Um, and it's not perfect again, it's but it's pretty darn close, at least mathematically. And I don't know if it's just the issue is the position of this locator, or again, something to do with the math and IK handles. But even I've seen it of, if I move an IK handle around, and rather than undo, I put it back uh, by zeroing it out, 
there's already rotations on the arm, and it's like, well, why is there rotations? That's that was the zero point. So, um, it's just weird things with IK. But anyway, pairing extending this to the FK rig should give us a place to uh, snap this guy to when we match the FK rig or the IK rig to uh, the position of the FK rig. All right, so that's two down. The third thing we got to do is uh, more fixing something sloppy that I did. Um, and let's go look at this wrist control. This wasn't sloppy unknowingly. This is sloppy of like, well, this isn't the best way to do this, but it's the fast way to do this. Um, so how this, uh, so let's look at this wrist real quick. Huh, already numbers here. Uh, but I had, uh, it was zeroed out when I connected it. Why is that? Um, it's one of those weird math things again when you constrain two thing or one thing to follow two things. So you can see right now I have it on uh, to follow the IK hand and the FK hand is off. But when I added that, uh, by default it came on like this. So one and one. Let's look at this joint now. Well, no, that doesn't do it either. Um, well, when I did this before without the video, that zeroed it out. But um, whatever. We, we don't want this and it's going to give us some funky rotations. Uh, as we're doing this FK IK matching where things don't line up too well because especially when you when you're switching between one rotation to another orient constraints and parent constraints do some weird stuff as they're switching um, and we want more control than that so I'm gonna go ahead and let's see yeah I'm just gonna delete that one I don't know if I need to delete the point constraint for now um, and I'm gonna delete the constraint on this hand and I want to be able to zero this out again and what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same thing but rather than use an orient constraint to blend back and forth we're just gonna make two orient constraints on two different nodes and then um, blend back and forth between the two and it's a little bit mathematically safer way um, yeah I, I wish I knew more about the underlying math or explain what's going on there but I don't um, might help me out too if I actually knew that but uh, we're working with what I got. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna so this hand zeroed out. Uh, let me see if I go over to FK if the arm is zeroed out. Okay, so I'm going with that, and you can already see like I same joints, just FK because I've moved it around while showing it to you guys. It has a couple numbers on it, uh, so let's just look at this again. I already got rotations on it. So, never found a good reason why, but I think it's just something about how that math happens on the IK solver. Uh, I've tried to read about it, but um, the math is way over my head. So, okay, uh, let's see. So, we want to make sure this thing is still lined up. So, uh, under risk control, um, and I'm going to orient constrain my control to my wrist. I want to make sure that's actually going to move. Okay. So, okay, I think we're okay position-wise. And what we're going to do is we're going to make some extra groups here. We're going to make a master group for the wrist. So rather than make that again, I'm just going to duplicate it and delete everything under it. And I'm going to make uh, two other of these groups. Um, and I'm going to call one... Uh, CT groups anymore. Um, wrist, uh, let's say elbow orient. Okay, let's be a little bit more specific. FK elbow orient. And IK hand orient. So I'm going to parent all these under that master group that I made here. So I made, I made three, whoops, made three new groups here that are just duplicates of the, where is it, uh, the left wrist control group. So I'm going to parent both of these under there, and I'm also going to parent the left wrist under. Actually, I'm going to delete this point constraint. Yes, no, uh, yeah, I'm just going to parent this. Under there, I'm going to leave that point constraint on. Okay. 
So the point constraint is, uh, for recap, saying it's sticking right to that point in the hand uh, because we're not controlling the position. If we were translating this joint with this control, then we didn't append it to loop because we're not, and we can do that. Um, let's see. OK, so we want this guy to follow the orientation of the elbow. So whenever the FK rig's moving, this wrist group is oriented the same way as the forearm. Um, and I want to do this with maintain offset on because these may be in different positions. In theory they shouldn't be, but I'm going to do it anyway because we have to do it for the hand anyhow. And I'll turn on my IK hand here. Whoops, that's not what I want. And let's see. I'm going to be extra, well, no, because it's going to be in this position either way. Yeah, let's just do this. Um, so grabbing my IK hand control and IK hand orient, constrain, orient. Okay, so now we have orient constraints under each of these. This one follows the FK elbow, this one follows the IK hand, and uh, our wrist will switch back and forth between them via a blend node. So I'm going to go make a blend node here. My hypergraph is the easiest way for me to get in there, usually. And so I went to rendering, create render node, and I'm going down to my utilities and blend colors. And I am mostly just interested about getting the uh, connection editor up. So the easy way I'm doing here is just dragging something and middle mouse dragging it onto another something. Whoops, something. Okay, there we go. I'm just clicking other. Um, so I want the blend color as the uh, input for right now. And let's see, we'll have the first one be the FK. I'm going to take its rotation, plug it in the color one, and then the hand uh, group, its rotation, plug it in the color two. So again, this thing is always oriented to the FK elbow control. This one's always oriented to the FK hand control. Um, and we're just going to blend back and forth between whatever those rotations are because these are oriented the exact same way as this guy is. So that's how we're going to switch back and forth between our rotations rather than using an orient constraint and switching back and forth uh, between the weighting because it gets some funky math as opposed to the blend. Um, and just when I was trying this earlier and using the script and the hand was not lining up and, uh, you know, look at the script like, yeah, it's copying the right numbers, but it's just not ending up in the right spot. Um, and once I built it this way, it would work fine. So, uh, okay. So back in our happy I should name this guy. Um, left wrist orient blend and load this blend node up as the output now and plug in the output into the wrist CT group. It's rotation. Okay, so, oh, and then we want to also control whether it's on FK or IK. Um, forgot that part. So reload that as the input and use the FK IK switch on the wrist control and plug it into the blender. So let's double check that this is working. So this should move. Nope, it's not moving yet. Uh, let's go 9. Is it going to start moving now when I rotate? Yeah, so I think that I think I hooked the blend up backwards. Let's try it the other way. Um, So rotate color two. So I think IK goes first and then FK. All right, let's try that now. Yep, that's more what I'm expecting. Now it's going 100%. Okay, and let's check. Why are you not undoing? Uh, Live demo. Okay, so that's matching. And
that's matching. Uh, you'll notice the hand isn't going because we haven't hooked it back up yet. So I'm going to go ahead and going constrain, and now in theory the hand stays at the same angle. There we go. So now we're back in working order again. So what we did was we built, uh, we deleted the orient constraint that was saying either be orient constraint to the wrist or be orient constraint to the IK hand control because the math was a little bit wonky there and not lining up perfectly. And I, you know, you might even be able to see when you hit certain rotations, um, your hand was not lining up with the control anymore. And it might be off at a slight angle, and that's that's just what happens when you try to deal with having two things you're constraining to. The math is not is not great on that. Um, so what we did was just constrained uh, these groups to only one thing because the math is much better when it's only constrained to one thing. And then we use a blender to blend back and forth between those rotations. And then that blender plugs into the wrist group here. Um, and all three of these need to be under the same group so that they could all be oriented the same way from the start. Um, so same concept, just a little bit more complicated way to get it there. But now we have something that works with this FKIK matching. So uh, I'm going to skip the right side for now. I'm just going to do this left side because it's all the same stuff for the right side. Uh, rewind and just you know imagine I'm saying right instead of left. Um, so now what we, we want is we're going to make a MEL script um, to handle switching back and forth. And actually I forgot to open that before I started, so let me find that mail script real quick. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm just going to open all these. Or no, I'm not. I'll skip that one for now. Uh, That's not the program I wanted. So again, I'm opening this up in Notepad++ just because it has some better features. Um, let's see. This is the one. So we'll start with this. Um, so well, let's let's actually see what we're going to be making here in a minute. Um, I don't need that one. Ah, that's what I was originally looking for. Okay, so this is the first part of the script that we'll do, and this is set up. And uh, this is uh, what will be um, actually running to switch back and forth. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, and this, this will just be mostly us looking at Notepad talking about what that does. Um, so let's go and uh, talk a little bit about What's going on? So we'll make a mail script button that handles this, and I've already made it here. Um, we'll see if this one works uh, uh, on this brick. I think I built it on the other one to start with. So hopefully all the parts are the same. Um, so we're going to make a script that, that does all the matching for us. So if we're in FK mode, it's going to set keyframes for us to hold our, you know, if we're saying IK rig, I need you to be in the same place as the FK rig right now. It'll go back a frame, set keyframes on the IK rig so it stays where it was at before, so we don't have weird drift, uh, you know, across 100 frames between when we last used it and when we used it uh, next, and uh, screws up our animation from when we last used it. So it'll set hold keyframes on those, uh, move it to the new position, and set a keyframe on it so it's just it's magically there. Um, and it's, it basically says, okay, I just finished animating in FK, I set keyframes there. And now jump back to FK and put FK in the same position, and I want to be in FK mode. Um, and it'll be like I was already in FK mode when I last posed my, my character. And now I could keep animating FK mode, or, or vice versa. I can't remember if I'm saying FK or IK there. Um, and, and so that'll all be done by script. And uh, if you have any of this part of the arm control selected, you should be able to just hit that button and it'll match from one to the other depending you know which mode you're already in. So if you're in IK, it'll switch you to FK, and if you're in FK, it'll switch you to IK. Um, this works great in this scene. Um, the problem is that script goes by control names, and it needs to tell, hey, you, this control, move to your new position. Um, that works great until we're referencing. 
And if we want to optimize our pipeline to be able to, you know, update this rig and have it update in, you know, 20 different scenes, he might have a namespace, um, which changes the name of this control. And now your script doesn't work anymore. And so the first step we're going to do is we're going to add on some stuff that allows us to always be able to run the script no matter what the namespace or current name of this control is. And uh, the, the way we're going to do that is there, there's attributes. Uh, you can't see anything here yet because they're not added, but they'll show up in here. And anytime we add something uh, to, oh, to a control, you know, they show up here. So here's the FK IK switch. Here's the stretch. There's, there's one called a message attribute, and I wish I knew more about this. I just know that if I plug one control's message into the other, um, so if I make a, a message attribute on this control, it'll add this new attribute here and it'll say, what do you want to map to? And I can say, well, message to the, every control ha or every object has something called a dot message attribute on it. So I'll say hook this new message up to the dot message attribute of this control. And then I could do, uh, hey, list the selected connection for this uh, attribute. And it'll say, well, that's this control, whatever its name happens to be when it's imported. You know, if it's imported, referenced, whatever. So that's a way I can get around referencing. And so we're going to go ahead and do that now. And the only way I know how to do this um, is by MelScript. I don't know how to do it offhand if there's a way in the menu. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this uh, and what we're setting up. Um, so the first part is whoops, actually adding the message uh, attribute onto these controls. Um, and you can see uh, it's just saying basically, so this is for adding them onto the left wrist control. So this script specifically only works to add those at attributes onto this control. Um, and I'm naming it. I, it. This is the type of attribute it is. Um, and here's what I'm calling it. Uh, and I'm basing it off of the other controller names, but I'm not uh, naming exactly the same. So when I'm reading this, I can tell the difference for one. But two, it's not left or right specific. It's just saying hand IK control. And that, that's fine because it'll plug into one that is specific. Um, and there's one for each thing that we need to use in this FK IK matching. We have the risk control because we need to control how it's oriented and uh, control the FK IK switching that happens here. Uh, one for each of the IK controls, including that uh, locator that we made so we could tell where the um, the elbow IK elbow control has to go for matching. Uh, one for the FK shoulder control and one for the uh, elbow FK control. And then we have one for each one of the skinning joints of the rig. And the reason I use the skinning joints, because in theory, then I only have to look at one set of joints instead of looking at the FK joints or the IK joints. Because if we're in FK mode, uh, these joints should be in the same position as the FK joints. If we're in IK mode, these joints should be in the same position as the IK joints. Um, so in theory, if I just read these, that'll get me the position of the joints. So that's the first part of the script. Um, the second part is actually hooking up the different controls. So after I've made, um, and, and by the way, you'll notice like this is plugged into itself. That's so I can, again, still be able to deal with those names and reconcile them because they're not left wrist control anymore. They're, uh, um, you know, John Doe left wrist control now because of referencing. Um, and this part is plugging in the actual control dot message into that new attribute that we made. So after I make it, uh, we can plug that connection in. Um, you'll see this This is all in one script right here. Um, I'd have to do this in two parts, because when I run a script, it, it looks at it all as a whole. And it'll run this part fine, but then it'll get down here and go, like, wait a minute, there's no attributes uh, made here. There's nothing to connect, because I haven't been made yet. It's all being run at the same time. So you'll have to run this part hit enter, and then run this part, hit enter. Um, and also, this only does it for the wrist control. Uh, it's one of the slightly annoying things about the button is you have to be uh, have selected one of these controls for it to work. Um, in theory, I could make it so that it sussed out the names of all the different controls and filtered them out to 
um, you know, just an arm if I wanted and just, you know, list all control names and, okay, when we find this one, if this one's here, then run this script with those names. Um, the reason I don't do that is because there may be more than one character in here that has the same control names. Um, and then how do you uh, tell that? You know, or we'd have to have two buttons, one for the left arm, one for the right arm. So it's a little bit easier if we could actually just say, you know, you got to have one of these controls selected for it to work. But we can make it easier. Rather than it always being the wrist control, how about if we just make it any one of the, the arm controls that you may, may be positioning when you want to do that switch. So to do that, that means we have to do... Oops, not this. That's me recording. Um, that means we have to do this and this for each one of these controllers, because it's, it's name specific. So if we jump over to this script... Where is it? Uh, this is me making all the attributes for the left and the right side. So we have this script here, and, and this is what I'll supply. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do these, well, I'll paste them all in. So copy and open up my script editor and paste those in. Uh, but I'm going to do them a chunk at a time just to make sure this all works, because if there's an error, I want to know where that error hits so I can start to figure that out. And so if I have this highlighted, and I'm going to hit enter on my number pad. If I hit enter my, by my, my letters, uh, this will just make an empty line, replace it with that. So uh, highlight it, highlighting it also prevents it from disappearing when you hit enter. So um, if I didn't have this highlighted, it would input all the script into here, and this section would empty out. Um, but by having it highlighted, it stays in, and plus I could define only run this part of the script. Uh, so I'm going to do it for this part of the hand. All right, good, that ran. And I'm just going to keep going through, and then I'll actually check. All right, that looks like that worked. I'm getting no red error messages, so that's how I, I'm pretty sure that's working. Maybe it's just a false sense of security. We'll see. All right, so this is, again, just adding that message attribute onto the controls. And we'll look at what that looks like here in a second after I get them all on. I guess really I don't need to do the right side, but what the hell, I'm already there. And, okay. So let's see what we just made. So in theory, I could grab any one of these control nows, uh, controls now, and I see this. And so this is what we made. This is a message attribute, and we don't see anything in here. It only shows up in the attribute editor. Um, and I'm sure there's some other way to make this. I just don't know where to go to do it. There's a menu somewhere that uh, I don't know where it is, probably. Um, you can see I can grab any one of these controls now, and, and they all have it on there. So I can run the script with any part of this selected. So that makes it a little bit easier. It's a little bit more scripting, um, but easier to work with animation-wise because I don't always have to, you know, maybe I'm mostly moving the, you know, the IK handle. I'm not moving the wrist, and I'm just like, oh, right, i got to grab this stupid control to hit that button. Um, so now I can just kind of have whatever part of the, the arm that I'm working on selected, and that button should work. Um, not yet, but that's the idea. Um, so we have all these. So now we actually need to hook them up, and we need to uh, let's let's see if I could go into the connection editor and load this up and see if there's a dot message somewhere in here that we could actually see. Nope, I don't see it in there. So. It was one of those things you just got to take my word on. And Maya's crazy like this. There's there's all this stuff that is hidden in here. You know, at least on a higher level like this, where um, maybe if I had the right thing to pair it with, it would show up. But um, they have these different things here that you could work with. You know, like that arc uh, length script that we use on the, the structuring rig. There's, I don't know if there's any button for that. Um, that's the only way I know how to add that. I mean, we could go make that little measuring tool that we did, but there's a bunch of stuff that's only available through scripts, so uh, this is how we're going to connect it up. And Yeah, don't ask me how people learn the stuff in the first place. I have no idea. Um, oh, here's my connections. So th these are connections just like in the connection editor uh, that we would do. So anytime you connect something up with the connection editor, uh, it spits out something like this. So like when we made that blend node, I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to find it here buried in all this. Oh, wait, no, there it is. Um, it spit out this bit of code. If I put this in, it would actually make that connection. Um, so 
you know, if you're starting to learn mail script, this is a good way to find out. And this is, you know, I forget what that script is all the time. Whenever I need to know, I just go oh, I connect two things in the connection editor and I'm like, oh, right, and then use the right names. Um, so each one of these controls has a dot message attribute on it that kind of says basically what it is. Um, that's kind of the gist of what I get out of it. I, I try to read up a little bit on what it is, but haven't fully understood. But all I know is what it does, and that's kind of the more important part in this case. Um, and this is the control that we're working with and the e attribute down here. So if we're on the left wrist, here's the the attribute it is talking about right here. So we're saying plug in the message of the actual left wrist control into this guy here. And so I'm going to go and copy and paste all this. And again, this will do it for each one of the controls. And again, I'm just going to do it one at a time. I can, I can do this whole script at once, um, but if there's an error, then I don't know where it is, and I don't know, like, Maya will run through this until it hits an error, and then it'll stop. And so if it gets down to here and, and hits an error, and everything else doesn't run after that, but it won't tell me that maybe it actually stopped here. So by doing it in smaller chunks, you know, it's just a safer way for me to uh, make sure it all works. All right, that one worked. Oh my god, I'm doing a live demo and all this code is working on the first time. I, I think I probably just jinxed myself when we actually get to the button, but we'll see. Well, it's not live, I'm recording it. I can always pause, but I haven't yet. Okay. So I put all those in and let's look at our controls. And, and now you can see they're actually hooked up to the control. So what I'll do on my script is query Okay, uh, we've got this control, um, and the script is going to say, hey, list your connections down here. Um, and it'll say, well, I've got the left wrist control, or whatever it's actually called. So if we reference this, it'll be, you know, if we reference it with a namespace of John Doe, it'll be John Doe colon uh, left wrist control, John Doe left hand IK control. So whatever the name changes to when you import it, you know, if you import it in and it does, like, paste it or something, I don't know, or import it. You know, it'll have that in the front, so it'll be able to work with this however it's brought into your C now. Um, it seems like an arbitrary step, but it, it really is quite helpful. It's one of those frustrating things about scripting stuff that, you know, it's often name uh, dependent, and if the name changes, all well, your scripts don't work now. Uh, and this is a great workaround to actually keep your scripts working. So now we get to do the fun part of I get to show you script and tell you about it. Um, and... Uh, It'll all be very exciting. So uh, this is just going to be kind of more of a, sh you know, more show, less tell at this point, but then we'll run through it and do it. Um, and, and this is commented. Uh, so these double lines here, uh, that's a comment. It doesn't actually do any scripting stuff. So I can write whatever I want here as long as it's started with these two little dash uh, backslash lines. Um, and always do this when you're scripting stuff because... One, other people might have to use this. So, like, in this case, I wrote this, and you guys might kind of want to know what this stuff does um, and can't watch this video every time you're looking at the script. And two, uh, I will come back to the script at some point and go, what the hell? Like, what? what is any of this? If, if I didn't have the commenting here, I wouldn't remember any of this stuff. I forget this stuff all the time. So uh, always spend some time, comment your scripts, because you'll forget it. Other people won't understand what's going on. Um, and scripts aren't useful if nobody understands what they do. So uh, hopefully my commenting is okay. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn off auto key. Um, auto key, when you're jumping back forth in the timeline to set keys on stuff, and any time a control moves, it's trying to set a key, will interrupt my script. Um, so I want to turn it off. But I also want it to stay on if I had it on. So I, you know, if I'm animating, I don't have to sit here and turn it back on over and over. Um, so what this is doing is looking at the current state of auto key. So we have an integer uh, on off is the same as 0, 1, or off on is the same as 0 and 1. So off is 0, 1 is on typically. Uh, so by uh, this flag is querying its state, or a query, and we're looking at its state. So any anything with a dash in front of it is a flag. And if you're not sure about mail script stuff, there is, where is it? Um, mail command reference. 
and this will probably show up. Okay. And you can go through here and look through any null script you're finding and see what flags are attached to it. So um, what am I using? I'm using uh, I'm sure. So I don't know if that stuff's going to come up under auto keyframe. Let's see if there's anything there. Um, so I think that's more than name. No. Oh, actually, here's our arc length thing. So let's look at this because that's another good example. This is what we use in, in stretching. Um, so it shows flags, and actually, so remember how we did that dash ch uh, stands for construction history. Uh, it's Boolean, which means it's an on-off thing, so you're just showing that in your construction history. So that's why we click that little curve info node uh, off in the attribute editor after we've made it down in here in the construction history. Um, but so going through this is really helpful to figure out different things, and, and a lot of time you can look up different stuff and see what they do, different commands. Uh, if that doesn't work, do a Google search for it. Uh, that's usually how I, you know, look back up how to go do stuff. I I use if statements fairly often, and I always forget how to write them uh, whenever I have to go make them. And uh, it's, it's a Google search away. Um, so we're storing this information as an integer. So it's you know it's a whole number. Um, and then we're basically saying if and giving it some state. So whatever it is, set it off. We really don't care what it's at. Uh, just in this case, set it off. And the reason we're giving it an if statement is is mostly just so we can undo later on. So if we run the script and we want to undo, it'll be able to undo this, and we won't undo and auto keys off because it only went like halfway through. It, it'll do the whole thing all the way off and back on, um, just by giving it a state. If we didn't define what the state was, it doesn't matter what it is. Just by defining a state, it'll turn back on via an undo. So that's just a little quirk of Maya. Um, that's the only reason that's that. I could say if it's one, do this, but this works just as well. Um, okay, so list the current selection. So uh, notice, I, uh, rem remember I said that you have to have part of this arm selected. So any one of the controls, the FK controls or the IK controls, um, it's going to list that selection. So that's going to get the current name. So if it is referenced in, it'll still be able to identify it as you know left hand IK control or John Doe colon left hand IK control, whatever it's actually called. And then it's going to save that name in here. And when we go to the next part, we want it to list out um, the various uh, attributes that we made. So um, th this is a string, so it's a, a string of words or letters or numbers. So uh, it's not a floating point number of one point something, and it's not an integer of a whole number, but you know it could be any sort of character. Um, and it's going to store it in here. Anytime you have these little brackets, um, this will store as an array. So uh, it'll start off as listing the, whatever the first thing is it finds as 0, and the next one is 1, and the next one is 2, and the next one is 3. So if you want whatever is in the third place, so say uh, say we're getting like rotations, it's getting x, y, and z. Um, ro rotate x would be 0, rotate y would be 1, uh, rotate z would be uh, Two, so it, just, it, count, it starts at zero and counts up, um, but that's how it stores that information. Uh, in this case, we're just telling it to list um, the connections uh, on whatever name we got here, because we're using this guy. And you can see we have zero plugged in, so we're getting whatever the first position was. Um, in theory, this could work with multiple selections, maybe. I don't know. I haven't tried that yet, actually. Um, well, let's assume you have one control selected still. Uh, but then it's looking for, okay, whatever control you have selected, the dot risk control uh, attribute. Whoops, it's in Maya that I'm trying to do that. So it's going to look at whatever control we have selected and look for this attribute and see uh, what's listed here. And it's going to store this name, whatever it's actually connected to. And again, when this stuff is referenced, it will have whatever the reference name is here or the imported name or whatever. Um, because it's connection. It's just saying, hey, I'm connected to this control, not this is the control's name. Um, and it'll plug that name in here. And now I can go through the script and have it always use that name for all the stuff I'm doing, because that's what I need to rotate around and match for the FK IK switching. So that is just one of these for each one of those to get the current existing names.
Um, so uh, this one um, is looking to see if you're in FK or IK mode and storing that number. So it's looking at the risk control here and it's going, hey, are you on one or are you on zero? And uh, just it's getting its number and it's going to store it here. And the reason I want to store it, so I could do this in real time. The problem is I'm going to do an if statement and it's going to say, hey, if you're one, do this. And if you're zero, do this. By, by doing a float first and, and getting the attribute and storing it, it, it stores whatever that number was when the script started. If I told it at the beginning the if statement that I'm going to do down here, hey, check this every time. Well, it'll run the if statement for uh, if it's on, and it'll look, yeah, you're on. But it's going to be switching back and forth during the script to match the FK to the IK. And then it'll also see, oh, hey, FK, you're on too, run the other half. And it'll, so if we're on uh, IK, it'll run the script to match the FK to the IK, and we'll be on uh, FK. And then it'll run the second half of the script and go, oh, I see we're also on IK and run the other half of the script and, and put us back. So we'll, we'll start right back where we started um, because of that. Um, so what we want to do is store the number because what it's going to do is run all these operations and see the numbers change. And it, both cases will be true because of that. But by storing it, that won't happen. Um, so again, uh, after all that confusing talk, we're, we're storing the number on the left wrist control to see if it's on FK or IK. And then we're doing an if statement, and we're saying uh, if mode state is equal to 1. Um, you'll notice there's two equal signs, and uh, MelScript's a little bit uh, weird about this stuff, but, well, it's not weird, it's just how it works. Two equals means equal to. Um, one equal means set the state. So you see up here we have one equal. So it's, saying, it's not saying this is equal to this. It's saying set the state of this to whatever we get from here. Um, so if I do set attribute uh, left wrist control dot rotate x equals zero, it's not telling it that it's equal to zero. It's saying, hey, set this to zero. Um, so it's a slight difference in language. So uh, just be aware anytime you're saying something has to be equivalent to this number to be able to do its thing, you need a double equal sign to be able to do it. If you're telling it, hey, set it to this number, then one equals. So a little bit different there. Um, but we're doing an if, and we're saying if, and this is our case, if essentially uh, the left wrist control is set to one uh, on an FKIK switch, then run this part of the script. And then we'll have another else statement that says, if it's not, then do this instead, because that'll mean it's on uh, FK. So. Uh, let's go down here. This part of the script moves you back one keyframe in time. So it's going to look at the current time right here uh, and store that number in time. Again, so we don't lose that number. It's then going to move you back one unit in time, so we go back one keyframe. It's then going to set a keyframe on all our FK uh, controls so that uh, they stay in place. Um, you know, if you're animating your arm going in an arc and you stop right here and you're animating in IK for a bit and then you're telling it and your IK arms up here and you're telling uh, Maya to go back one step and just you know, if you skip the going back one step and having the old keyframe um, your arm would end up here but your last keyframe was here and so if you set a keyframe from say here to here before an FK that's where it's traveling to if you don't go set a hold keyframe right here, because you know you just stopped animating here, you didn't necessarily say, "Hey, hold out and stay here" by setting a keyframe. Um, if you didn't go back and set a keyframe, what would happen is this thing would drift over that whole time you were animating the FK up to here, and your animation in this part right here would be all off. So what we're doing is we're going back one keyframe, saying, "Hey, right up to now, just keep staying right where you're at. That was perfect. Stay there, don't move." But when we go back to the current time, now you're moving. Now you're up in this position, but you stay here all the way up to one second ago, or, or one frame ago, and now you're back over here where we're actually animating. So that's what's happening here. So we're going back, we're getting the current time, you know, so if we're on frame 800, it says, okay, we're in frame 800. 
go back to frame 799 here, set a keyframe and all that stuff so it doesn't move, and then we go back to the current time. And that's why we saved it as an integer here so that we could go back to it because uh, we just said query time, you know, plus one. Well, I, in theory, I guess we could do current time uh, plus one, but same difference. Um, so after that, what we do is we look at um, the joint position uh, rotations for each one of the joints. So we're looking at whatever the rotation is for the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist, and we're storing those numbers. We'll then set a uh, keyframe, you know, again on current time, to switch the left wrist control to switch over into FK mode. So it's, it's switching. So it was in IK mode now, it's switching to FK. Um, and it's setting a, a keyframe on that. Um, then we get, uh, let's see. No, now we're setting the um, controls to the same rotation uh, that the joints were in. And because, again, the way we set up our FK controls, they're lined up the same way as the joints, those rotations are interchangeable. Now, you'll notice it's doing X form, query, and dash WS stands for world space, and dash RO stands for rotation. Um, so we're querying in world space what are the rotations for these, and then we're setting them uh, in world space, the rotations. Um, the reason we need to do world space is because these things are parented under different things, and the actual amount, they, they appear to be rotated to themselves, the numbers in here, you know, we couldn't just take the numbers out and plug them into those controls. It wouldn't be quite the same because, um, the, you know, depending on how they're set up. Um, so we always want to use world space. So it, it's not going to be the number in here. I wonder if we can, can I see this in here? Is there anything that just shows world space? Well, it shows the world space for the pivot. Um, not quite the same thing, but, you know, it's, it's much like if we were rotating with this tool and it's looking at, okay, relative to, you know, the world, how are you rotated, not relative to your parent rotate everything the same way that way. Um, and so if, if two things are oriented differently, but you, you, well, not necessarily orientedly differently, but, you know, have a different parent so that rotations would be different, even though they could be in the same spot, uh, world space is a way to get that number. So I, hopefully I, I haven't just completely confused you explaining that, but, um, it accounts for differentiation between, um, you know, dealing with the parent here versus the parent control that we have uh, over the control. So, you know, potentially it could work, but this is the safer way to do it. Um, so after we rotate these to be in the same position as the uh, IK joints we're in, um, we then set a keyframe so they, they stay there. So... Uh, uh, let's backtrack here. So we went back and we set a hold keyframe on all the FK controls so they don't move before the keyframe that we're on now. Um, we then look at the position of all the skinning joints. And the reason we look at the skinning joints is because we're currently in uh, IK mode. The skinning joints are following the IK rig. Um, and when we made the FK arm, we aligned the controls to be the same way as the FK joints. So again, those numbers are interchangeable. So we should be able to take these numbers, plug them onto this control, and it should be in the same position as the IK rig now. Once we do that, we set a keyframe on everything so it holds. So we set it on the rotations of each one of the controls. We set it in the FK IK switch so that it stays in that position. Um, and that's the end of that. So that matches the FK to the IK. So that's fairly easy. Uh, now we get to what if you aren't in IK, what if you're in FK? So if that's the case, then we run this script. So if left wrist control is set to zero, here's what we run. So same deal. So we go back when, when keyframe in time, we set a keyframe in all the IK rig stuff so that uh, it stays in place before we move it to the FK positions. So we set a hold keyframe so the old animation uh, isn't uh, disturbed. Uh, we then go back to the current time. We look at uh, the world space translations of the FK uh, PV loc. So 
that little locator we made, we, we we're seeing where in world space is it, not relative to, um, you know, a parent or anything like that, and just where overall in the world is it. Um, and we do the same thing for the wrist. We're looking at the wrist joint to see where that is, because that's where the IK handle needs to go. Uh, and then also we need to see how the wrist is rotated, because uh, uh, th this one's a little bit different, because before an FK, the wrist was just following uh, the orientation of the elbow, and the only thing that could rotate the wrist was the wrist control. When we're in IK mode, we've doubled up. So not only can I rotate the um, wrist control, but I could also rotate because uh, I undo that thing where I reverse the numbers. I must have. I must have undid too far at one point. Um, let me do that again real quick. Uh, oh good, you're still here? Yep, okay. Uh, so this is that thing I did before where I think I hooked the numbers up backwards, but then I undid some stuff and I think uh, I did not hook it back up right. So I think we determined IK good, FK goes first? Uh, heck if I know. No, that's the mesh. No, I want the controls. Okay, so where are you? Well, that's weird. You're not even hooked up at all. Um, maybe I grabbed the wrong thing last time. Okay, so your color two, color one. Okay, that's what I was expecting. So now the wrist goes with that. Um, so what I was saying before, uh, I interrupt myself with uh, stupid stuff, is that we have two ways to rotate the wrist. We have this level, and then we have this level. Um, so when we want to match the FK to this, we'll have to deal with that. And, and uh, well, no, it matched the IK to that. Um, and de deal with that, and we'll, we'll put rotations only on one control. We'll put it all on the wrist control so we're not um, dealing with the IK control because the FK rig doesn't have any equivalent of that. It, it's just all on one level on the wrist. So we need to take the extra rotation off of here and put it on to here to be able to keep it in the same position. Um, so anyway, we're, we're querying the, the... So dash Q, query, dash WS, world space, dash arrow, rotation. So we're looking at the world space rotation of the wrist joint. Um, we're switching modes, so we've gone from FK mode into IK mode, and we're setting uh, the IK um, hand control into the position of where the wrist was, the wrist joint. We're setting uh, the rotation of the IK hand to, oh, I guess I did it the other way. Oh, right, we, we do this. I'll explain this in a second. Um, we set the IK uh, hand control uh, to the rotation of the FK wrist. Um, we move the IK control to where that locator is. And then we zero out the wrist control. And, and the reason we're, we're doing it all on the IK uh, hand instead of on the wrist control, we want to switch. So maybe I animate an FK here. We want to put that all onto the IK hand control because that's how we're doing hand planting. So if you know I plant my hand like that, you know, body moves around, hand can stay planted. So that's why I use that orientation, just because sometimes it's a little bit easier to you know keep the hand in, in line with that. So like if I'm rotated this way, and I need the hand to slide off the platform. It's it's a whole lot easier if the IK handle is oriented the same way as it's rotated. So if I did that through hand, it's this way. Well, now I don't have any arrows that line up with that. So that's that's why I choose to do that. Um, so basically saying, hey, before your all your rotations were on your wrist control, let's put it all in the IK uh, hand control and 
zero out whatever is actually in the risk control. And we need to zero this out because otherwise it would double up. It would take those rotations that were just in hand control and put them on the IK. Um, and we still have them, and it would double up that way. So it would be twice as rotated as it was before. So we need to make sure to go back and zero those out. Um, what do we have left? Oh, set a keyframe and all those things that we just moved so that they stay in place. And that's it for that side. And then after all that's done of going through if A, then do this, if B, then do this. And then it, the final thing it does is say, hey, if we were, had auto key on before, set it to whatever it was on before. So if it was on, it sets it back on. If it was off, it just it sets it to off because that's what originally got from up here. So uh, now I get to do a test and see if that button works. And if it doesn't, then I pause and you guys through the joy of virtual entertainment uh, get to see uh, nothing happen and uh, I edit a bunch of stuff out and make it magically work. Um, so let's go ahead and start setting some keyframes here. So I'm going to set a hold keyframe here and I'm going to turn my timeline way down here. Okay, now let's do this every 10 keyframes. And we'll say that's the position I want. That's another. Uh, I don't know what I'm animating, just you know, putting his hand up for some reason, maybe saying hi. And now I decide I want to be in FK mode. Uh, so I don't move my timeline, that's the last key I set. Um, you can turn any script into a, a button. So let's go ahead and copy all this. I'm going to paste it in here. And if I want to turn this into a button, all I have to do is uh, I'm going to select it all. I'm hitting Control-A. I middle mouse drag it up into any one of these menus. I, I put it in a custom one. Uh, and that makes a button for it. And I, I could go and edit this button some if I go into, uh, I think, Edit Pop-Up here. Is that what I want? Shelf. OK. Um, and I'm in here. Here's the script that I've, I've made. And I could change the image I want. There's a bunch of default icons Maya has uh, that I could switch it to that I could browse through in here um, if I want to. Um, icon label, you know, change to what the mouse over is. So when you mouse over it, you get. Do I not get a mouse over? Because I'm recording. Um, and then if you don't want it, there's this little trash can icon over here. I can little mouse drag it over there. Uh, I'm just deleting that one because I've already made it here. So I'm going to click this button, cross my fingers, this actually works. Not quite. It missed something. Okay, so looks like we got some, at least I can undo, some extra rotations there. Uh, why is that? So let's see where this is going wrong. So. 27, 3.9, 27, 34, 63. Let's see what happens when I run this again. Yeah, so that's way off. Um, so we're looking for, should be taking these rotations. All right, well, let's at least look at that, so. Oh, I, don't, I need one of the controls selected. Nope, that's completely different numbers. So let's try to figure out what's going on there. Um, all right. I'm going to try something and make sure that's the right script first, because maybe I did something else. Oh, come on. Weird. All right, now, yep, this is where I pause and then figure out what's going on. And we're back. Uh, I figured out what it was. It's something I did in this rig uh, that's making it not work. And uh, it worked in my test run, but uh, I used the female rig. And I didn't do something in her that I did in this guy. That sounds horrible. Um, so if I go to the arm, uh, I changed the rotation order on these joints on the elbow because I thought you know, I was talking about that and said, hey, maybe this is better. Um, but the control has a different rotation order, which would change how it ends up rotating. So I'm going to change these just all back to XYZ. 
for easy solving. Okay, so now we have a hand going up into that position. And now when I click that button, now I gotta have one of the controls selected. Yeah, you can see there's a little bit of jitter happening. That's it jumping back a frame and going forward, but it's pretty much in the same position now. So now we're in FK mode and you see we get this nice clean animation up to that position. And let's go another 10 frames. We'll animate a couple of keyframes. FK. Oh, that's looking for the elbow there. <laughs> okay, so that's that position. And we will go back into IK. And I'm sure I'm not negative there just because that's not fair. The IK, or you can't do that. Okay, yeah, I didn't go past that center point. Um, something else to notice too, you might want to lock out the elbow so it can't go farther than, you know, if we're going negative, go in, can't go past positive uh, because the IK read can't do that also. And we'll click this button and we'll switch back into IK mode. So there, you can see we have seamless switching from one mode to the other. Um, again, notice I didn't yank the rig out at any point because that brings on the scaling. Um, you know, if you're building it on your stretchy rig, you could just uh, turn your stretch off, and that's not an issue anymore. Um, or if you didn't build stretching, that's uh, another way to handle that. But that's how that starts to work. Now, if you did want to incorporate the stretch, um, what you'd have to do is, is because it gets a little bit tricky because, you know, kind of the same thing with the wrist rotation. Um, on the IK one, oh, let me turn that back on. Not only can we stretch it, but then we could also add on whatever we decide on here as well, which the FK rig can't do that. Um, it just has the one... Oops, not that. Uh, it just has the one scale node for each of it. So to figure out the scaling, you'd have to uh, you'd have to get the current length of the joint on the IKA version. So you'd have to go look at the length of the joint, and then uh, you would have to let's see, uh, you'd have to have one for the FK arm. And you'd have to, just like we made that uh, curve to measure the length of the IK arm, you'd have to have one on the FK arm uh, plugged into the same condition node so it doesn't go below one. Um, and you'd have to do some math of, of saying whatever that out uh, output number is um, from that condition node after the scaling. Uh, that minus, or I think, no, the scale of the joint minus that length. Because that's whatever's extra. Because if it has both, you've got to take out the default length plus, you know, and whatever's left is what that joint is actually at. Um, so you'd have to do a little script that that says that. Um, and let me let me go ahead and open that because I've, I've gone and done it. It's just it's so much harder to get lined up. I you know it just it never is quite. I don't want to say perfect, but it is. It doesn't line up. Um, quite as well as this one does without the scale, which is why I'm skipping it, plus the old, whole other can of worms. Um, so let's just look at this real quick. Essentially the same. We have one other message node we'd have to make for that condition node that I was talking about. So um, you'd have to go make that condition node and uh, add that in your messages so you could always be able to source that too and see what number it's spitting out. Um, See, essentially all the same stuff. You'd have to start throwing scale in here. Um, see. Oh, that's not the right one still. Oh, I know why, because I opened it up in Notepad. Let me try that again. Okay. So, um, where did I add that in? Oh, I, I don't think I did add the message in. I think I was just 
doing it by name for the, uh, the time being until I can figure out how it worked. So here's the extra stuff, the indented stuff. Uh, so we got the set the keyframe on the FK shoulder, IK shoulder. Um, got the get uh, store the scale, whatever the current scale is. Um, have to set it to that. Uh, set the uh, the scale controls to those, um, and then set keyframes on them. So that I think that's just if we're on FK. Yeah, so FK. So that's that's the easy one. IK is the, the pain in the butt one. Um, so again, getting getting the current scale, storing those numbers, pasting them in. Um, now the IK is a little bit trickier. So you're looking at what is the added on shoulder stretch and elbow stretch on there. And then, uh, where did I start? To, well, you set a keyframe of those. So that's the first thing you hold them. And then, uh, so you're looking at what those numbers are. And then here's that condition node. So I'm also getting the number from it to see what the current scale of the FK arm is. So I can subtract that out of what the overall scale is on the FK or the IK arm to get whatever the remainder is to plug in. Because otherwise we'll get double the scale. We'll, we'll get, you know, whatever the current number is plus another 100%. Um, uh, we set the attribute to whatever that math is, and you can see here's that math of, I, yeah, I'm taking the, the length of that uh, arm joint and subtracting out the overall length of the FK arm. Um, and that gets us the remainder, which gets us the proper scale. So, uh, quick note on that, if that doesn't quite make sense, don't sweat it too much, but play with it. Um, once all the other stuff makes sense, that one shouldn't be too hard to add on. Um, but that's FKIK matching. We jumped into a bunch of Mel script stuff there. Uh, just kind of covering that. But the more you play with it, the more that stuff starts to make sense. Um, and we talked a lot at the beginning about proper setup for an arm. So, you know, if you're building a rig, planning on doing that stuff, I always recommend doing it from the beginning. Um, the reason I don't is because here's what everybody asks me, especially when they're looking at rigs or learning the setup, and I, I jump straight to that stuff. I'm like, well, really, is that necessary? And, and honestly, I can never answer anything but, like, well, no, it's not. It just kind of covers your butt to save you some, from some extra work um, if you do end up doing it. But if you don't, then who cares? Uh, you're not going to use it then, and there's no reason to do all that extra work to make sure everything is in line to have it. Um, I like to do it just as a safety net for myself, just so that if it does come up, then I've saved myself a bunch of time. It, you know, it's, it's minor investment up front for bigger payoff potentially in the end if it does come up. And if it doesn't, whatever, I, you know, spent maybe another hour or so setting up stuff. Um, so that's FK, IK, arm. Remember, you got to add in those, uh, you need to add in that locator. You need to lock out your elbow joints so you only bend on one axis. And you need to change how your wrist is rotating, or it probably won't line up using that orient constraint. You'll probably get some funky stuff. Um, so hopefully you're able to follow that. Uh, and uh, well, well, we'll see you next lesson.